Welcome to Hot Chips 29. Session 7, Neural Net 2. Welcome to the second Neuralnet session. Hope everyone had a great lunch break. My name is Yunsup Lee, co-founder and CTO at Sci5. We have three greats talk today. The first talk is by Paul Watmo. He is currently with ARM Research Boston, working on market architecture for machine learning accelerators. He's also an associate at Harvard School of Engineering and Applied Science, researching circuits, systems, and design techniques for machine learning applications. Prior to that, he was a research scientist at Philips NXP Research Labs UK, working on DSP architecture for software-defined radio applications. He received his bachelor's degrees from the University of Lanchester UK, his master's from the University of Bristol UK, and a doctor, doctorate degree from University College London, UK. Please welcome Paul to the stage. Okay, thank you, Yunsup, for the introduction. So good afternoon, it's my pleasure to be here today at Hot Chips. Um, I think I have the unenviable task of following not only lunch, but also Jeff Dean. <coughs> um, so I'm gonna describe some work we did at Harvard over the last couple of years. Okay, and I'll start here with deep learning, although it's already been introduced many times today. Um, I'm probably not the best person to do it, but nonetheless, um, here's, here's my view on this. So it's often said that deep learning techniques emerged as a result of this virtuous cycle. So here we have access to more compute and bigger data and this allows us to train deeper and deeper neural networks. And these things are capable of um, solving increasingly complex problems. And let's be clear about this. Supervised learning has been an incredible success. Um, and it's now commonly used in a wide variety of applications. And in fact, neural network inference has rapidly become um, such an important workload that we've already seen hardware specialization in commercial chips. So, for example, we've seen GPUs um, which are optimized for 8-bit uh, integer performance, and this is, of course, driven by neural network inference. And we've also seen dedicated ASICs for data center neural network inference, such as um, the Google, Google TPU, which is shown here, and Cliff's going to tell us more about that later in this session. Um, so it, generally, I think deep learning has become quite synonymous with very high performance hardware. And so what about the embedded masses? Well, mobile and IoT devices are probably the largest and fastest growing computing platforms on the planet. And Neural networks are really important technique for many of the use cases of these devices because neural networks enable these devices to interpret the world around them. And they do this through sensor data. Now currently, these devices perform neural network inference usually by offloading to the cloud um, where the compute resources are much less heavily constrained. But doing this incurs energy, latency, and security overheads. So there's a big push to try and move more of the neural network inference back onto the device. And in particular, always on sensing applications, such as keyword spotting, a really big driver for this. However, this is a pretty, pretty tough challenge because neural network inference requires you know, a large memory footprint and lots of compute. 
So generally, I think the strong motivation here for hardware on mobile devices that can support this neural network inference workload. This is what I'm going to talk about in this talk. So what does the workload look like? Well, uh, here's an example of a fairly typical processing pipeline for a sensing application. So we typically consume raw sensor data, and we often pre-process this, um, for instance, by normalizing mean and variance, essentially centering the data. And we often perform feature extraction in these types of workloads. So th the algorithms we use here are more like traditional DSP-style algorithms. And then we classify this feature vector, and we, for that, we'll use something like a fully connected deep neural network. And it's this classifier at the end of the processing chain that really causes the problem for constrained devices. The reason is we need um, to touch a large set of data for the train weights, and we also have lots of computes for the classifier itself. So the classifier is typically designed ahead of time, offline. Um, and we presented a paper at ISCA last year which showed some techniques um, along with a framework that allows you to sort of optimize neural networks for low power devices. And really what we're doing is taking a set of labeled training data and we're running a series of training experiments to try and um, find this Pareto optimal curve which is essentially a trade-off between prediction error, in other words, how good we are at a task, and the number of weights, so the size of the network. The size of the network determines how much storage we need and how much compute power we'll have to spend. Now, once we've trained a network, we can quantize this. So we usually train using floating point numbers. So for inference, we want to quantize to reduce the amount of storage we have to do. And typically, 8-bit or 16-bit integers are sufficient for inference. So once we have a trained, quantized model, we can then deploy this in our applications, and we can use whatever we have available to us on the SOC for this. So it could be a CPU, or a DSP, or a GPU, or an accelerator. But accelerators offer by far the lowest power consumption, so that's the approach we're going to study in this work. In particular, I'm going to describe this Accelerator designed at Harvard, so this is called the DNN engine. So this is a programmable accelerator for neural networks. And from a computer architecture perspective, um, neural network algorithms are particularly interesting um, because they have some quite unique properties. So they have lots of parallelism, and there's lots of opportunities for data reuse, and they operate on sparse data. They can use small data types, and they're also inherently noise tolerant, so they can they provide a certain amount of algorithmic resilience, which is really interesting. OK, so here's an outline for the remainder of my talk. I'm going to describe this DNN engine accelerator design. Um, and then I'm going to present some measurement results from our 16 nanometer test chip. And then I'll conclude the talk. So this is a toy example of a fully connected DNN graph. Um, the input, we have uh, an input vector, a set of values. So this could be, for instance, pixel data from an image. In the middle, we have the, the so-called hidden layers. And on the right-hand side, we have the output nodes. So these give us the probabilities for the classes. And each node in this graph is known as a neuron. And each connecting edge represents a multiplication with a unique weight. OK, so within this graph, there's a huge amount of parallelism. In fact, within a given layer, there's practically no data dependencies whatsoever. So instead of processing one neuron at a time, we can actually process a group of neurons in parallel. So I'll run through a quick toy example of how this works with four parallel, parallel neurons. So we start here at the top of the first hidden layer, and we read a value from the top of the input vector. This value gets multiplied by a set of unique weights, and that sum gets stored inside the neuron. And we proceed to run through all the values in the input vector. Then when we finish that, we can add the bias term and apply an activation function. And then these neurons are finished, and we can store them back for use in the next layer. And we can proceed through the graph calculating all these values until we have all the values for the output layer. So this toy example shows us processing a, a tiny network, four neurons at a time. Um, this naturally raises the question, how much parallelism should we exploit? 
So increasing parallelism increases throughput, but it also increases efficiency. And the reason for this is because we reuse the data values. So the blue line here shows that as we increase the SIMD width, the normalized number of data reads we have to do comes down dramatically. But unfortunately, um, increasing parallelism also increases the, the memory bandwidth for the weights. The reason for that is because in fully connected layers, um, we, there's no reuse in the weights. So the red line here shows that as we increase our SIMD width, we also increase the memory bandwidth. And in computer architecture, the computer is nearly always constrained to some extent by memory bandwidth. So for the DNN engine, we implemented an eight-way SIMD data path, which is a nice sweet spot where we can achieve a 10x increase in activation reuse, but still use a reasonable 128-bit AXI channel. So how do we implement this algorithm in hardware? So here's a simplified block diagram of the DNN engine. It's essentially a, a stripped-down, eight-way SIMD accelerator. I'll quickly run through how it works. So first, the host processor loads the configuration into registers, and it loads the input data into IPBuff. Then we accumulate the activation and weight products. So we spend most of the time doing Mac operations, and this is fed by IPBuff in the input layer and XBuff in hidden layers and the weights are fed from a one megabyte SRAM on the SOC. Okay, and when the in-flight neurons are complete, the activation stage adds a bias term and applies a rectified linear activation function, and the values are written back to XBuff. XBuff is double buffered, so we can simultaneously um, write values from the current layer and read values from the previous layer in the same cycle. And when the accelerator is finished, it can send an interrupt to the host CPU, which can go ahead and retrieve the output data. OK, so the data processed in the DNN graph contains a large number of zero and small non-zero values. And since operating with these small values, it's very unlikely to affect the neuron accumulator value itself. Um, we can actually ignore those operations. And this allows us to reduce the workload. So let's look at a quick example of how we do this, and I'll use the same toy graph as before. So in a typical application, the input data itself is also typically fairly sparse. So we first start by thresholding these values. Any values smaller than the threshold, such as the red nodes here, and we can discard. And the values larger than the threshold, shown by the black nodes, we can write back. So when we do this, we actually prune the connectivity in the following layer. And this means we don't have to do as much work. So when we start processing the graph, uh, this time we only have to visit two nodes in the input vector rather than four, so that's a lot less work. And now when we finish these neurons, before writing the activation values back, we can threshold them, and any values smaller than the threshold, given by the red nodes here, we can discard. We only write back the black node. And we can keep working through the graph in this way. And as you can see, we've done a lot less work than we would have done if we processed it as a set of dense matrices. OK, so in the microarchitecture, we make a few small modifications for this. So firstly, we add um, a comparator in the activation stage. So this takes the finished um, accumulator values and compares them with a programmable threshold. It generates a skip signal, which can be used to predicate right back to XBuff. And we also add um, a small buffer called nbuff, which stores a list of the active nodes in the current layer. And this is used to generate addresses for the weights, which have become non-contiguous. OK, and we also support small data types, which are commonly sufficient for neural network inference. Often 8-bit data types are, are fine with a bit of work and training. So um, WMAN supports 8-bit or 16-bit fixed points. OK. So neural networks are actually inherently noise tolerant. And this is a really interesting property for computer architects. Um, so we presented a paper at ISSCC early this year, uh, which demonstrates 
timing error tolerance of this particular architecture. And I wanted to just quickly mention it here. Um, <clears throat> so we apply timing error detection to two critical stages of the design. So we apply timing error detection circuits for the weight load stage and also the MAC data path. And this, using the information from these timing error detection circuits, we can um, actually drive a feedback loop so we can reduce the supply voltage. And the reason for doing this is it allows us to win back um, static voltage margins, which account for um, PVT variation. And the interesting thing here is that usually when we apply these kinds of techniques, we need a very heavyweight error correction scheme. Well, here, actually, um, because our algorithm is inherently error tolerant, um, we don't have to do that necessarily. And again, I'll, for the details, I'll defer to the ISSCC paper. But I just wanted to show this plot quickly. I think it's quite interesting. So this is a breakdown of the, the timing violation rate that we can tolerate for this data set. So it's broken down by memory in, in red, data path in blue, and the combination in gray. And as you can see, the memory, faults in the memory are very uh, easy to tolerate in the algorithm. The data path is much harder, and that's because of the accumulators where errors can be persistent. But in the ISSCC paper, we described a number of techniques which are relatively simple and allow us to improve the combined timing violation rate by over six orders of magnitude. And really, the headline result here um, is that for the aggregate combined rate, we can tolerate timing error rates uh, in excess of 10 to the minus 1. And this is all without degrading the prediction accuracy. OK, so let's take a look at the measurement results. So this is a simplified block diagram for our 16 nanometer SOC. And the target here is for always on um, sensing applications. The SOC is based around an ARM Cortex M0 microcontroller cluster and associated peripherals. Um, it's fairly self contained, it has a small amount of I.O. on the SOC. Um, the DNN engine instance has um, dedicated supply voltages and clock domains, so we can perform a wide range of voltage and clock scaling experiments. And we have a tightly coupled uh, one megabyte SRAM on the chip. And this is used to store the, um, the, the model weights. OK, so here's a picture of the flip chip package die. Um, it's in a custom 100-pin BGA package. And a photo of our development board, uh, which we host over USB, in this case, a very uh, snazzy purple laptop. And some measurement results. So these are all measured at the nominal supply voltage in the sign-off Fmax. Um, and they show energy per prediction in microjoules. The workloads are for always-on style applications. So these are things you might actually be running currently on your smartphone. The first two are for handwritten digit classification. So this is the well-known MNIST data set. The one labeled face is a face matching algorithm, which uses the labeled faces in the wild data set. KWS is keyword spotting. So this is a problem where we try and identify certain keywords within um, a stream of audio. And HAR1 and HAR2 are two human activity recognition data sets. So here we're trying to recognize the pose of the body, human body, or even different activities like walking or running. Now, as you can see, the energy varies quite wildly with, well, varies to some extent with different applications. And this basically depends on the size of the networks that we're processing. Um, and so the first two digit recognition examples are quite interesting. So the first one is a much bigger network than the second. So it requires two and a half times as much energy. But that only actually gives us an improvement of 0.3% in accuracy. So you can see that in some cases, um, we get 
quite marginal gains in accuracy can cost a huge amount in energy. Now, most of these models are around the one microjoule per prediction level. And actually, using on-chip memory is absolutely critical, because these energy numbers include absolutely everything. It includes the compute and the memory and the interconnect a lot. But if we were to use um, DRAM for the model storage, our one microjoule energy budget would only really buy us a few kilobytes of data, which is, which is certainly not enough. So you really need to be running these models from on-chip SRAM. And this constrains the model size, because it limits how much storage you can have. So if you have lots of SRAM, that's going to take lots of area and probably take lots of leakage power, too. OK, so here's a breakdown of how the different architectural techniques um, improve the, the energy number. So we start here with um, normalized energy. And the first bar on the left shows um, our baseline number, which we normalize to 1. And the first thing we can do is switch down from 16-bit data to 8-bit data, which reduces our power consumption. Um, then the next thing we can do is, using the timing error detection, we can reduce the supply voltage and remove worst-case voltage guard band. And then finally, a less technique, we can um, exploit sparsity in the data, and we can um, skip a huge number of operations. So altogether, these measurements demonstrate a 10x reduction in energy and a simultaneous 4x increase in throughput. OK, so here's a survey of published results for um, dedicated hardware accelerators. And this is on the well-known MNIST data set. <clears throat> the, th there are a number of different um, neural network techniques here, including fully connected deep neural networks and spike in neural networks and even CNNs. It's quite hard to compare um, these designs uh, quantitatively because they're all designed for different performance points and they're all in different technologies, so you need to take this with a grain of salt. However, I'll try and draw out a few interesting remarks. So the first is that we're really interested in the accuracy point here towards the top of the graph, because a simple linear classifier can achieve around 88% on, on this data set. So below that, it's fairly trivial to solve this problem. And as I noted before, um, the different stars for the DNN engine actually represent different neural network sizes. So um, as we saw before, getting higher accuracy tends to give us an uh, exponential increase in energy. And it's interesting to think where we might be going with this um, particular plot in the future. So where does the next 10x improvement come from? And I actually um, was quite inspired by some of the remarks made before lunch. I think techniques such as model distillation might be a, a great way for very low-end um, neural network problems to sort of reduce the model size and reduce the compute cost. OK, so that was quite a technical deep dive on our, our design. Um, but here's some high-level takeaways. So I think there's a general trend to try and move inference from the cloud back to the device. One of the drivers for this is always on sensing applications. I described the DNN engine architecture. So th this exploits um, three different properties. We exploit parallelism and data reuse. We, oh, we um, operate on sparse data natively and use small data types. And we exploit algorithmic resilience. At measurements of our 16 nanometer test chip, um, showed that it's really critical to store the model in on-chip memory in these applications, because if you have to go to DRAM, you just blow your power budget. And we demonstrated a 10x reduction in energy and a 4x throughput and improvement. And we can achieve around one microjoule per prediction for many of these always-on applications. I'd like to acknowledge uh, support from DARPA, DARPA, Craft, and Perfect Projects for this work. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have time for a couple questions. Please state your name and affiliation first. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, this is Deepu Pal from uh, Wave Computing. Uh, question is like, you showed uh, results from MNIST. 
uh, in general, uh, results from MNIST are always very optimistic with small amount of computation, and it doesn't really reveal what happens in uh, CNNs, which are more complicated. Uh, so uh, my question is that uh, when you go to, what's the size of these networks that you have tried? Because that's very important. Have you tried it on uh, color images? Because when you go from uh, MNIST to Cypher, there's a change. And when you go to ImageNet, all those things that you see in papers don't uh, normally hold in terms of precision and other things easily. It's fairly complicated. So can you, can you elaborate on what you can actually do or what size network can you run? Yeah, sure. So that's, that's a great question. Thanks for that. In the introduction, I tried to put some distance between what we're looking at here and much more difficult neural network problems, such as, like you say, color images, things like Cypher or, or ImageNet. So we're certainly not going after that. But we're doing things here in around a microjoule, which you certainly you know, can't do but, ImageNet in. Right, so just I'm trying to look for the representative problems. Sure, so I think commonality, there's commonality there. I think it's been quite well known we can use small data types, even for ImageNet size problems too. The sparseness is also there as well, so it's certainly possible to exploit that as well in bigger designs. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, the uh, uh, other thing is how many how many things per second because that's important because in a real application a number of uh, things that have to be done in real time yeah don't necessarily represent what happens in a data center. So, so this design will run up to a gigahertz so we can do a huge number of classification per second way more than we need to do for real time but we can also back that off and run it in low power modes too. So like for example a camera will be 60 frames per second or 50 frames per second. Second, so yeah, we can, we can easily keep up with that sort of frame, right? Yep. Okay, thank you. Yep. Hi, um, Jason from Facebook. Uh, my question is, uh, I see the accelerator uses CMD and uh, it also skips computation um, for small activations. Can you elaborate how that works together? And also, uh, can you comment on the memory access pattern? Yeah, so that, that's actually a really good question. So um, SIMD we works when we works with the dynamic pruning of the activations. So we only read one activation value, and we reuse that across um, all the SIMD channels. So that means that when we prune in the previous layer, uh, we can just skip the values that we, we pruned. We don't actually store those back. Does that make sense? What about the memory access? Yeah, so memory access um, becomes, becomes nonlinear when you start skipping things. So to generate the memory access patterns, we have a small buffer which stores a list of active nodes. And from that node list, we can generate the right weight addresses. Thank you. We have time for one more quick question. Hi, this is Song Han from Stanford University. Uh, so I have a question about um, what is the, uh, is, does the same system have any DRAM or does everything relies on SRAM? And what is the model size that can be supported? And the second question is uh, with respect to the uh, batching case, uh, does the system also support batching? Uh, since after ReLU, the activation sparsity is different for different input images. Uh, so how do you deal with that case? Yeah, so two good questions. So I think here we have around one megabyte of SRAM on the SOC. So after that limit, you'd have to start going to DRAM, or probably in these applications, it might like be off-chip SRAM or flash, which is even worse. Um, so does both the weight and the activation uh, seats are purely in SRAM? In this yes, that's right. So the activations are, are relatively small compared to the weights, but yes, that's correct. And, um, and second question was, Matching where the activation sparsity is different for different inputs. Yeah, so that's a really good question. So, so batching is difficult to do when you exploit the sparsity. We, we don't actually do it here. It's a good problem to look at, I think. Because as you mentioned, the problem is the activations start to blow up with batching because you, um, you're discarding different activation values. Yeah, but we, we don't do that here. Okay. Let's thank Paul again.
So our second speaker is Shin Dongju. Dongju is currently working towards the PhD degree in the Electrical Engineering Department of Korea Advance Institute of Science and Technology. He received the bachelor and master degrees in the same department from KAIST in 2013 and 2015 respectively. His current research interests include low power digital processors and multi-core architecture, especially in machine learning and computer vision fields. Here's a pro tip, he's looking for a job too, so let's uh, welcome Dongju to, to the stage. Thanks for the kind introduction. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dong Ju Shin from KAIST Korea. Today, I'd like to talk about an energy efficient deep neural network processor, which is named DMPU. And also, we will talk about an on chip stereo matching processor for depth image generation to support RGB and depth for channel processing. So, this slide shows the brief summary of the MPU. It is designed in 2015, and it is designed for embedded deep neural network processing in mobile platforms. It has a heterogeneous architecture to compute efficiently for both in conversion layers and MFPRN layers. Also, for the conversion processor and MFPRN processor, um, there are uh, many features to have higher energy efficiency uh, we will talk about in the later slides. In addition, on-chip transmitting processor is integrated for decimal generation to support full-channel RGBD processing. Next is targets of the MPU. As I mentioned in the previous slide, um, the MPU targets embedded in your network processing in mobile platforms. To support um, the process in the mobile platforms, it requires low power and high energy efficiency. Um, the uh, target text is vision. It is not limited, uh, but the main target is vision. Uh, so for the vision, the large amount of uh, real-time data is main bottleneck for the cloud computing. And also, a high throughput and embedded computing are required to operate in real time and low latency. To satisfy these requirements, DNN dedicated SOC like DMPU is required. With DMPU, robot drone, smartphone, wearable devices, and home appliances uh, can have a smarter artificial intelligence and we give more values. The MPU targets both conversion neural networks and recurrent neural networks. So why both conversion neural networks and recurrent neural networks? CNN has a strong ability to extract visual features and recognize it. And RNN has strengths for sequential data recognition and generation. And also, by combining CNN and RNN, we can do much more complex things. Extract visual features from CNN are used as input for the recurrent neural networks. So in the image captioning, um, visual feature is extracted by CNN, and RNN generates the uh, caption sentences by the extract visual features. However, in the previous DNN dedicated SOCs, almost of them are only optimized for conversion layers or MLP and RNN. This slide shows the um, energy efficiency comparison for the different types of hardware. It is not a you know, fair comparison because um, their fabrication technologies are all different. And also, uh, some of them include their peripheral power, but some of them are not. However, um, the trends shown in this graph will not change. C 
BPU has a most general and a programmable architecture with the lowest uh, energy efficiency. On the other hand, uh, the MPU, which is ASIC for the mobile platforms, has highest energy efficiency with uh, de highly dedicated architectures. So uh, from CPU, GPU is developed to uh, increase the parallel computation uh, capability, and it has much larger number of um, computation ALU. So in dim neural networks, there are many uh, parallel computations. So uh, we can accelerate a dim neural networks by GPU. However, dim neural networks has very formalized and fixed data type and fixed computation pattern. So higher energy efficiency can be achieved with the dedicated memory architecture, dedicated memory um, type and dedicated data flows and dedicated data type. Uh, to, to achieve the further um, energy efficiency, the MPU uses a uh, heterogeneous architecture and a more dedicated architecture. So um, to achieve higher energy efficiency, uh, the MPU has um, lower programmability than others. However, the neural network itself has very high adaptability for various applications, so we can use many years. Then why do we need heterogeneous architecture? Um, as shown in this graph, the neural networks have very heterogeneous characteristics. In the conversion layers, um, it, it has the computation dominant characteristics, so it has a large number of mega operations with relatively small number of parameters. In the case of multi-layer polycetron and recurrent neural networks, it has a, a huge number of parameters with a relatively small number of mega operations. So in our heterogeneous architecture, in the conversion processor, image corner and conversion reuses are maximized to achieve high, high energy efficiency, and also to reduce the feature map size. Dynamic fixed point with online adaptation is proposed. Also, we use distributed memory architecture to efficiently map the conversion operation, and also we can have um, higher scalability. For the MRP RNN processor, it use, uses matrix multiply architecture and to reduce the huge number of weight parameters, we adopt the weight quantization. And also with the quantized weights, we can use the LUT based multiplication, which is named Q table, is used. This slide shows the overall architecture. It consists of conversion processor, MLPRN processor, stereo matching processor, and a risk controller. In the conversion processor, it can support any size of a kernel with the maximum utilization at 3 by n kernels. And it can support stride 1, 2, and 4, and uh, it supports 2 by 2 pooling operations. In the MRPRN processor, it can support any size of, of channel numbers, and LALU, sigmoid, and Tanzan's hyperbolic activation functions are supported. For the stereo matching processor, we have 64 depth levels. So in the conversion processor, there are four conversion cl clusters with total 16 conversion cores. Four conversion cores in a cluster are similarly connected to generate the final um, accumulation result. And each in each conversion core, they have 
own image memory and weight memory with a 48 PEs. There are three different types of networks. First is data NLC for uh, feature map and weight transactions, instruction network for simultaneous core controlling, and partial sum network for accumulation. Uh, we propose mixed across division method to handle the various configurations in conventional layers. We have limited on to memory size, so we cannot hold the every data for the computation. So workloads should be divided. There can be three different types of workload division methods. First is image division and channel division and mixed division. In the image division method, um, the image size of divided images, the weight and height are reduced proportional to the number of division. division. And each divided group is uh, processed independently. And for the channel division method, the weight and, uh, and height of Images are the same with the original image, but they have um, many divided channels. In summary, for image division, uh, it needs multiple chip accesses for weight, so it can have advantages when the weight size is relatively smaller than image size. In the channel division method, it requires multiple accesses for partial output, so it can have advantage when weights are larger than input image. So right graph shows the re um, results. So in the front layers of conversion layer, input images are larger than the feature map, so image division can have advantages. And in the, but in the deeper layers, image size is getting smaller and the channel number is getting bigger, so channel division um, method can have advantage. In the mixed division, it can achieve the lower points. Next is layer by layer dynamic fixed point. As shown in these two graphs, data distribution and data range for each layers are very different from each layers. So to handle this large range of data, a floating point operation is effective. But the cost of floating point operation is higher than fixed point operation. So to achieve the advantage of both, uh, we, we use is the dynamic fixed point. In the dynamic fixed point, both length and fraction length are fixed in the uh, same layer, but it can differ from uh, each layer. So it can have floating point characteristic via layers, and it enables fixed point operation in the same layer. In the previous offline learning-based approach, um, we, um, we should choose the re uh, optimized fraction length for each layer. So in the offline method, fraction length is trained to fit with given image data set. So a selected fraction length is used for every image at runtime. So it needs offline learning. In the proposed online adaptation method, a fraction length is dynamically fit to the current image with the, with the overflow monitoring. So online learning with the online learning based fraction length selection, we don't need a offline learning. So and also, uh, it can fit into the current image. It can achieve lower required word length. So in the performance comparisons, red line shows the result for the proposed adaptation method. Um, 
Even in the four bit water length, it achieves um, similar accuracy for 32 bit floating point accuracy. In the MRP RNN processor, we have two different types of multipliers. First is vector multiplication, and next is element wise multiplication. Element wise multiplication is uh, just simple 16 bit fixed point multipliers. Um, in the case of vector multipliers, it has eight quantization tables, and it can compute 64 multiplication in a cycle. We can see this in the later slide. So if we map the a fully connected layer to the hardware, the fully connected operation can be easily mapped into the vector multiplication. And also for the RNN and LSTM layers, uh, the left, uh, left shows the more complex operations, but it is also just a matrix multiplication with, with a few number of ele element-wise multiplication. So it can also maybe into the same hardware, so we can share the hardware for MRP and LSTM. In the MRP RN processor, uh, we use weight quantization. For the fully connected layer and LSTM layer, the weight can be uh, quantized to um, lower bits. If we use these four bit indexes for 16 values, we can achieve um, similar accuracy for the 32 bit accuracy. It can differ from application. Uh, in this case, we use image classification and image captioning. So for the Q-table constructions, multiplication between input and quantized weights are also quantized to uh, 16 values. So th these 16 values can store in the Q-table, uh, which is a lookup table. So when we need to uh, multiplication, uh, we only need to decode the index to load the pre-computed result. With this Q-table-based multiplication, um, weight can be quantized to from 16-bit to 4-bit, so 75 object accesses can be reduced. Comparing with a 16-bit conventional fixed point multiplier, it has um, the power consumption is reduced by 80%, and the um, logic delay can be reduced more than 90%. Now let's move on to um, the RGBD things. Um, so why do we need R RGB and depth rather than just RGB? The reason is higher accuracy than RGB. For the object detection and uh, image segmentation, um, we can easily and more accurately uh, generate the output image with the depth image. And also for the face recognition, uh, we can recognize the 3D face, so we can detect the fake face on the uh, paper. Also, for the car detection or object detection, if the background is, has similar color with the object or car, uh, we can easily find the object with that. This slide shows the market forecast for 3D imaging and sensing devices. Um, as you can see in this graph, uh, the market has not uh, grown last few years, but 
uh, it will grow rapidly in the recent few years. Um, and next is big data and transfer learning. We have more than one million images in the ImageNet database with um, 20,000 since that. With this large number of data, we can uh, train the network very strongly. So in the image classification, the network accuracy is now better than human. And also, rich visual features from these kinds of big data can be used for uh, learning for other vision tests with smaller data sets by transfer learning. And these kinds of things also can be achieved in uh, 3D imaging. So 3D imaging can be increased with uh, consumer 3D imaging devices. The amplification on RGBD DNS uh, will be uh, coming soon. Um, so this slide shows the architecture for the storm matching processor. It has a feature extraction block, cost generation unit with stereo SRAM, and cost aggregation unit, and um, winner takes or block and cross check block. Today, the time is limited, so we will uh, briefly see the key features. So in this slide, we use this uh, computational S frame for the cost gener generation. So it's, um, it's array. Uh, in the stereo SRAM, there are two arrays, and each array, uh, the right feature and left features are located. And the middle of arrays, um, the cost map generation circuits are located. And also in the SRAM, we use this hierarchical bit line to minimize the bit line switching. For the efficient generation of the aggregation window, um, integral image is used. And in this slide, we propose the first care integral image. In the full scale integral images, uh, integral image can be generated with the full independent land region, so uh, full way parallel processing can be achieved. And also, for each independent region, maximum range can be reduced to 25% value, so data widgets can be uh, reduced a uh, two bit amount. For this method, no additional method, additional computation and memory access is required because uh, below full weight can be calculated the aggregation same, uh, same amount of computation. So this slide shows the chip photograph and summary. We use is uh, 65 nanometer CMOS technology with 16 millimeter scale die area. It, it can operate at uh, 20, 200 megahertz um, and 1.1 voltage and uh, 50 megahertz at uh, 0 0.77 volts. And the energy efficiency is 8.1 tops per watt when we use probit watt length and of 0 0.77 voltage. Now let me conclude my talk. Um, the MPU enables the embedded DNS in mobile platforms. It uses a heterogeneous architecture to achieve high energy efficiency with conversion processor and MLPRN processor. And it integrates the on-chip stereo matching processor 
to generate the um, depth image to support the RGB and depth channel operation. And next version, the MPU is for large input images and large corners. Thank you. Thank you, Tungju. We have time for a couple questions. Okay, um, while people are getting ready, um, I guess I can ask you a question. Can you tell us a little bit about the software stack of your chip? Do you support any kind of frameworks or things like that? Um, well, we can uh, co-accelerate with Cafe framework. Okay, um, let's thank our speaker, Tungju. So our third speaker today is Cliff Young. Cliff Young is a member of the Google Brain team whose mission is to develop deep learning technologies and deploy them throughout Google. He is one of the designers of Google's Tensor Processing Unit, which is used in production applications including Search, Maps, Photos, and Translate. TBUs also powered AlphaGo's historic 4 to 1 victory over Go champion Isidore. Before joining Google, Cliff worked at DE Shaw Research, building special purpose supercomputers for molecular dynam dynamics and at Bell Labs. Let's welcome Cliff to the stage. Thank you. It's great to be at my very first Hot Chips. So I'd like to do a slightly different hot chips talk than the usual. Usually the talks here I think are about, here's our latest new chip. And in fact, this is a chip we've had for two and a half years in Google data centers. And so in some ways coming from my perspective, this is the old thing. Uh, Jeff already told you about cloud TPUs. And this is the device that came before that. It's an inference only device. And part of my goal in the talk today is to think about what did we set out to do? What did we actually accomplish, and how well did we do in retrospect now that we've had some opportunity to actually run these things in data centers? I think I can steal a bunch of introductory material from a bunch of the other speakers and just say Moore's Law is embattled these days. We care a bunch about Moore's Law at Google because our data centers scale thanks to the wonders of Moore's Law, and we wish we had another miraculous decade like the 90s, but it's not looking like that's about to happen. So, What's happening? Transistors are not improving the way we'd like them to. Power budgets are not uh, following Dennard scaling anymore. We've already gone many core on the machines that we uh, install in our data centers. And so one possible way forward is domain-specific architectures. Focus down on a small attack surface and do the things in that small attack surface extremely well. If only there were an application area which was of broad ap applicability but annual to acceleration because you did a very small number of tasks extremely well, like deep learning. And I think other speakers have spoken a whole bunch about deep learning, but I think we've been amazed at Google at the ways in which search and our general infrastructure and speech and video and imagery and the AlphaGo match have changed the way that we do business. Deep learning's fundamentally in that it's quite surprising to me that, for the most part, you can squint and look at the deep learning computations and say, wow, that looks like matrix multiplication with a little bit of garnish in between. And in fact, even the convolutional neural networks look a bunch like matrix multiplications. So maybe we can focus down and get a whole bunch of advantage out of building a deep learning accelerator. Uh, let me rip quickly through these. Jeff talked about the difference between training a network versus deploying or performing inference on a network. The TPU first generation is an inference-only accelerator. So you've already got a trained network, and you're going to do a whole bunch of map models to process the sequence of input data to turn it into a prediction. Other people have talked about the importance of batch size and how it's in some ways an easy source of parallelism. We have leveraged this to the hilt in the TPU, and we use batch size to gain efficiencies. And that's also in some ways a fundamental limitation of our TPU approach, our TPU first generation approach. I'll get onto that. And many people have also talked about reduced precision arithmetic and whether you need 
all 32 bits of single precision floating point for my triple E, or whether you can get by with something smaller. And indeed, for inference, you can get by with things that are smaller. So what's the story with the TPU? Where did it come from? Why did we Google, which is you know, for a very long time dependent on general purpose CPUs, embark on building our own ASICs for this particular weird area? Around 2013, Jeff made an estimate about, well, what happens if everybody wants to talk to their phone for three minutes a day? Like, take every Android device on the planet, take three minutes a day, calculate the ops you need to process that. And the answer came back as we would need to double or triple our data center spend, have support a fleet that's two to three times what we have today, which is kind of difficult to do. Or put another way, Urs Hulsle had a, a wonderful quote in regard to the breakthroughs that were happening in deep learning. He said, I've seen this happen before. And I'm not sure whether it's going to happen next month or whether it's going to happen three years from now, but at some point, somebody on the brain team is going to come back to me and say, Urs, if we only had 10 times as much compute as we had today, I could make this much more money. And so a bunch of the GPU project is about saying, let's, let's invest and find ourselves some other options so that when the success disaster strikes, when we are buried in cycles for deep learning inference computations, we have an answer. Our project has a, had a theme of go fast and run with scissors. And so the, uh, the project was like, launched, and we actually were in data centers 14 months later, which is an incredibly quick development cycle for a hardware project. I, I, I'm actually quite surprised we, we ran that quickly. Um, and it was kept under wraps for a very long time. Only after the AlphaGo results of last year did Sundar, our CEO, announce it at Google I.O. last year. So this is a picture of our smaller form factor TPU card. This is a backwards compatibility play. This is actually a three and a half inch drive slot form factor. It turns out that our TPU draws little enough power that you can take an existing server that has an empty drive slot and put a TPU into it. And so we can upgrade our existing servers without having to tear racks out. There's also a different larger form factor that looks like a GPU and racks up four TPU cards to a CPU host. Uh, and that uh, plays to some of our more compute intensive kinds of deployments. The AlphaGo match was played on a rack of those sorts of machines. I'm going to talk about actual workloads that run in Google data centers. And they've been somewhat anonymized. Uh, we have three categories. MLPs are stacks of fully connected layers or just mat moles. LSTMs have more mat moles. A few other operations are the basis of the recent sequence to sequence speech and translation breakthroughs. And CNNs are the things that are very familiar to architects, uh, which I think the Microsoft guys were pointing out have a very nice ratio of, of compute to input output or storage sorts of requirements. Um, I think we've said. One of the MLPs is RankBrain, which uh, helps with showing search queries. Uh, one of the LSTMs is Translate. And one of the CNNs is Inception, which is something that everybody benchmarks. Uh, a couple important things to draw out of this slide. One is that the amount of code to program this, the second column from the left, LOC, is very small. And that's because we program these machines in the TensorFlow framework, which Jeff talked about. It's an infrastructure that we're hope, hoping spans everything from research to deployment, from embedded to data center. So that's at least a proof of concept of how easy it is to use TPU-like devices. Another interesting observation is percentage deployed, the last column on the right. We were kind of surprised after all the effort that we put into building convolutional neural network support into the TPUs, how small a fraction of our actual deployed work it is. Uh, I think there are huge, obvious applications for convolutional neural networks. We all have cameras in our pockets, and the Internet of Things is making our world visible and listenable in a number of ways. But that wave hasn't quite hit yet. I'm not sure why, but I think it's coming soon. OK. So how do we build the TPU? It slots into a PCI Express slot. It's an accelerator card. It's connected over the I.O. bus, PCI Express. Uh, it works like a floating point unit. It's a coprocessor. It, doesn't actually have a branch instruction of its own. Instead, it's got a very tiny instruction set, and the host processor says, do this. This diagram is unfortunately a bit of an eye chart, but I thought it'd be fun to spend a little time diving in a little bit to details of TPU architecture. This was actually an internal development diagram, so it's maybe not laid out as beautifully as you'd like. But the compute center of the TPU is this matrix multiply unit which has a 256 by 256 systolic array of multiply accumulate units, 8 by 8. So that's 64K ALUs running at 700 megahertz. 
The main register file we call the unified buffer. It's 24 megabytes of on-chip memory. And if you kind of think about how a risk load store pipeline works, then the, I can draw a loop on this diagram that corresponds to, the, to four of the five stages of a risk pipeline. And so we read from the unified buffer. We pass those results into the execute phase of the matrix multiplier. Those results get accumulated. That's a side effect. And then they get written back to the unified buffer. And that's actually the, the main loop of the machine and where we spend a bunch of time programming the machine. Also, there's these DDR3 DRAM interfaces on the side. And that turns out to be an interesting bandwidth limit. We, uh, we built the machine in 14 months. DDR3 was the memory technology that was available to us. Had we been able to access better memory technology, as I'll talk about in a sec, uh, we could have done a bunch better in building a more balanced system. So this is as close as to a dime micrograph as I'll get to show you guys. But uh, roughly, the summary is the yellow bits are compute, and that's about a third of the chip. And the blue bits are memory, and that's about 4 tenths of the chip. And, and so it is a, a nicely compute-intensive processor compared to many of the other designs we've seen in recent years. Let me switch a little bit to the software view, which is where I spend a bunch of my time. There's only 11 instructions in the Cisco instruction set of the TPU, and we use really five of them to get the work done. And they correspond to read from the host, write back to the host, so that's input and output, read weights from the DRAM, do a map mull, and then do an activation function, which is the garnish that basically hooks together these matrix multiplications but doesn't allow them to be folded back together in a linear algebraic sense. The CISC instruction set is a, kind of a shock to many of my co-authors who are famous for their work on risk machines, but it turns out to be a wonderful way to encode matrix multiplications. Our machine is really doing a variable length by 256 by 256 matmol stripe in any given instruction, and to be able to, to dispatch 2,000 instructions, sorry, 2,000 cycles worth of work in a single instruction leads to very compact instruction encodings. And so instruction streams are not a really big deal for us. On the other hand, we've kicked a whole bunch of complexity down the road to software. So there's no branches on the machine. It's an in-order machine. There's exposed pipeline hazards on this. Software has to lay out every single buffer and make sure that things overlap in just the right way, uh, which is complicated, but I think the right way to get to market quickly. So the harder design was simplified. If you push work into software, then you'll then pay down your technical debt after deployment as you figure out what the new networks are that you want to run on this machine. Uh, let me talk a little bit about systolic arrays, which are a beautiful 1970s computer architecture technique that wasn't quite right then, but we think is right now. And in many ways, it's just two-dimensional pipelining. So take your beautifully regular matrix multiplication, which has a three-dimensional structure I can draw for you, and then map that into the two-dimensional structure on the chip with a third dimension that you take back out in time. So in a systolic array, we place the weights within the 256 by 256 array in the machine. We inject inputs on the left side of the array, and we as each input moves across the array in sort of a broadcast fashion, we multiply by the weight at each point and then accumulate sums down the array and uh, completed sums for the entire vector matrix multiply exit at the bottom. Uh, if you're paying close attention, that timing doesn't quite work out. There's nasty stagger bits that actually make this operate correctly. But it, uh, it's been worked out 40 years ago how to make this run uh, ex exceedingly fast. So, once you have built a correctly operating systolic array, if you're the software person, you can say, I'm just going to act as if a single 512 clock cycle step of this array happens in one conceptual cycle. It turns out you can program the machine as if you're doing matrix vector multiplies. OK. So let me switch modes from architecture and compilation to performance. And for this study, we chose to compare to two contemporaries of the TPU. So, our first chips came up in the data center early in 2015. At the time, our data center CPU and GPU parts were 18-core Intel Haswells and NVIDIA K80s. It seems worth noting a couple of things about comparison points to those two other platforms. One is that TPU Dyer is really quite small, less than half of that of the other solutions. And our thermal dissipation point is much smaller than the other solutions that were available to us at the time. I'll also do comparisons of performance per watt, and in those cases, I'll be doing full up servers as deployed in the data center. And so this slide is basically talking about those details. So one way to think about high performance computing devices is to use the roofline model. And basically, rooflines are a nice way of combining the two limits of the memory bandwidth 
limitation on performance with the peak compute limitation on, on performance in a single graph. And so the, the vertical axis is roughly achieve performance out of peak. The flat part of the roof line is when you hit your CPU, sorry, when, when you hit your compute peak. The sloping part is your memory peak. And so if you can't feed the compute units of your machine fast enough, then you'll end up under the sloping part of the roof line. So that indicates that you're in the difficult to program part of running your machine. So let me take my six benchmarks and put them on a TPU. And this roof line basically shows that, yes, we are reasonably efficient or reasonably close to our peak operation on the TPU. But as it turns out, we didn't build a particularly balanced design, that only two of the benchmarks are actually underneath the flat part of the roof line. And the other four are actually bumping up against the, uh, the sloping part, which means they're memory limited. Uh, that was a conscious choice. Uh, we thought that we were building a machine for this throughput disaster, that we'd be buried in inference cycles because of everybody talking to their phone. As it turned out, we're not quite that buried. And there are other constraints, actually I should go along in the slides, that come into play. So let me compare the TPU to Haswell CPUs, which have a, a different roof line. Notice that the bent part of the, of the roof line, the, sl the slanty part that refers to memory bandwidth, is much better. And so C CPUs are easier to program better balanced machines. Uh, but they're not quite hitting the top of the roof line in the peak case, and neither do our GPUs. K80s are below their roof line, uh, kind of across the board. So one question is, what gives? And the answer is that we built a throughput machine, but it actually turned out that we use it in a latency-focused manner. So in serving inferences for, say, a search query, we have millisecond time constraints about how quickly a page comes back. And if we take too long, you get upset with us, right? And you're like, I, I, I need my search results right now. So it's on the order of 10 or 7 milliseconds response time. It turns out that if you want to do these kinds of inferences on CPUs and GPUs, then hitting the response time requirements causes them to drop below their performance peak. Uh, this chart just puts together the three different devices. Circles are the CPUs because they're well-rounded. Triangles are the GPUs because they, they uh, render triangles. And the stars are the first-generation TPU. And I guess one other thing I didn't mention earlier is that roof lines are typically drawn on log axes, which I don't know if your brain that works that way, but I can't reason intuitively about log axes. So here's the linear projection for the same thing. OK, one more mode switch to performance per watt. Uh, so let's go back to whole systems with driver CPUs and the associated accelerator cards and look at performance per watt for the whole system and incremental where if you subtract the host CPU back out. And those numbers have turned out uh, impressively well for comparing the first generation TPU with equivalent CPU based inference calculations or K80 GPU calculations, 80x and 30x res respectively. So the roof line plots tell us that we were memory bandwidth limited. We didn't actually put in particularly good memory as part of our rush to get to market. So what would happen if we could borrow the GDDR of a GPU? and go from on the order of 30 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth to 180 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth. We built a, a model of how the TPU operates. It turns out that this is not a complicated machine. There's no fancy out of order sorts of stuff in it. And so the model actually tracks reasonably close to reality. And when you do that, the roof line for the, oh no, this slide isn't going to work. The roof line actually moves up and to the left. I'm sorry, this slide, I, I didn't fix the blend for it. But basically, the, the roof line would move over here to the tune of about a 4x performance improvement on the benchmarks that we were running. So if we had spent the additional three to six months, we might have gotten 4x. I think in terms of uh, go fast and run with scissors, we, we made the right call, but we ended up with a trade-off that has limited some of the generality of the applicability of this machine. OK, so if you revise the TPU and put the GDDR memory system in, then the speed ups over Haswell and K80 era machines are even more dramatic in the 200x and 70x uh, regime. In some ways, the slide has been obsoleted by the cloud TPU, because we now have a next generation machine that does have a much better memory system. OK. There's been a bunch of work in this field over decades, not just on the neural network side, but also on the architecture side. I'm amused to note that an, on a, a recent uh, Follow-up paper, we were dinged for not citing enough related work. Uh, I, I don't know. There should be some sort of hash token you can put in to, to say, and here's all the related work I'd like to, to, to refer to. All right, so let me 
some of it. I think, so there's two charts of conclusions because we, we are a bit detail-focused and data-driven at Google. But at a, a very high top level, I think that the TPU succeeds because it's an exercise in application-specific co-design that we targeted just neural network inference, not neural network inference and training, that we don't, you know, by virtue of having a, a beautiful clean sheet design, we get to build just the things in for the first generation that we want. Um, as TPUs go forward, we will also get to do backwards compatibility support in various different forms. And so that'll be interesting to see how, how well the choice to build a matrix machine ages. Um, but aside from the general theme of hardware software co-design or even algorithm hardware software co-design, there are a bunch of different contributors that are all driven by that rubric of how do we deliver performance on this particular uh, application area. And so, yes, a large matrix multiply unit. Uh, I think I, I joke a bunch that I have a machine with just one gigantic hammer, and the hammer is, you know, a 92 tera op hammer. So it's a pretty big hammer. Uh, there's some interesting software implications about that hammer. If you noticed in that main loop cycle of the machine diagram, you really have to do a matrix multiply to move any data at all in the machine. And so if you mem copy in the machine, it turns out you should use an identity matrix to like move stuff around. So maybe one aspect of having a gigantic hammer is that, yes, everything looks like a nail, because everything has to look like a nail. If it doesn't fit in the nail, then you've got to go back to the host CPU. Substantial software-controlled on-chip memory. Uh, we don't need to worry about aliasing or memory reference conflicts. We know exactly where the buffers are. And so we have perfect alias analysis when we build our machines, or sorry, build our programs. Run the whole inference model. So one of the design principles was take your huge stack of neural network layers, suck the input into the device, and then keep on chewing on it on the device until you have the final classifier output at the top, then send that back to the host. And I think that get out of the ping pong operation mode, other people in this, this conference have pointed out that's a, that's a failure mode. I think TPU v1 is designed very much to stay in that no ping pong, focus on the accelerator, run on the fast path. Single-threaded deterministic execution model. So one beauty of programming the TPU is that there's only a single thread of control. Like, I don't know about you, but I find 18 core machines hard to think about. And especially if they're 36-way hyper-threaded and there's all these memory hierarchy bits and locks to, to handle, that's, that's work. Whereas 92 tera ops in one thread of control is a huge amount of power. Uh, that, I think, has actually eased some aspects of our deployment and of our programmability issues in, in mapping and delivering this kind of transformational performance to, to power AlphaGo and to do translations. Um, enough flexibility is an interesting thing. I think this community is quite sophisticated about this, but oftentimes when I meet people who are thinking about accelerators for the first time, they think that there's like CPUs over here and ASICs over here and nothing in between. And in fact, we all know in this room that there's a huge spectrum of possible implementations where you might take CPU-like programmable features and you might take ASIC-like blocks and meld them together to, to solve your problem. And in fact, a linear spectrum is perhaps overly simplifying. There's a huge design space of possible trade-offs. And I think we attempted to pick the right point in that design space, or a decent point in that design space. I guess we got the memory bandwidth thing wrong. But uh, so that even though we were designing in 2013, and so the state-of-the-art neural networks at the time were essentially one successor of AlexNet and another, again, stack of fully connected layers that was doing acoustic processing. By the time we got to 2015 in deployment, we were able to support Inception and LSTMs on the TPU. And sort of there's a bunch of insurance policy hardware features that we baked in to the TPU design where the goal was, well, we're not actually sure whether we'll have to use this insurance policy, but we've paid up front to have the policy. And then when LSTMs go live or when Inception goes live, we can pay more in terms of software effort to, you know, I guess, pay the, the software deductible and then redeem the insurance policy to actually keep our machine relevant. Mission of GP features, obvious, 8-bit integers, people know about that, apps and TensorFlow. Uh, second page. So this is totally obvious in retrospect, but it wasn't obvious when we were designing the machine that our inference applications need latency more than throughput. Uh, maybe they need both, but the seven millisecond thing wasn't at all visible to us when we were considering the speech success disaster. We thought, well, everybody's talking to their phones. We're just going to be buried in, in ops, and you know, it, it'll be cool that we can process that at all. That whole end-to-end -end responsiveness thing hadn't actually occurred to us. 
Um, let's see, let me skip the KAD comment and go on to the redesign. Yeah, actually, we have a good memory system now in the second generation TPU. I think the comparisons come out really quite impressively well for the time period in which we were operating. And so I think we compare fairly to, com compare favorably to Haswell's and to KAD GPUs. Uh, half the die size and half the watts with a huge factor in peak ops is uh, it's kind of cool. I think, this is Dave's observation, 10x differences in computer products are kind of rare. And it's been a, a real privilege to get to deliver, in some cases, more than 10x improvement on a number of our real applications. So that's my talk. Thank you very much for all the interesting hallway conversations. And I look forward to Q&A and also to more hallway conversations. Great. Let's take some questions. David Cantor, so uh, great talk, uh, great ASIC. Uh, what is the minimum size of uh, sort of a problem that you need to get efficient use out of the TPU? Uh, right, because TensorFlow is an enormously expressive uh, ecosystem. And so there's some things you could probably write that you would say, hey, I want to keep this on the CPU or you know whatever piece of hardware and what's sort of the uh, uh, right way to think about that and how the system makes those decisions. Right, so the question is what's the minimum size that the TPU actually pays off for you to, to port to it? Um, I, I don't have a complete formula for you. Uh, I, I actually have some colleagues who ported single layer map moles to it and seem to feel like they got mileage out of it, which I was kind of surprised by. I was expecting that that surface area to volume contrast, you know, quadratic input, cubic compute, wouldn't pay off within the space of a single mat mole. But at, at least people did those experiments and said, yeah, it, it actually looks faster than what I can do on CPU. Um, but I think the goal really is do neural network models of a certain size, uh, where you know, tens of layers and hundreds of millions of weights. Um, I guess some of the ones that I actually listed were much smaller than that. So uh, we do pay off on those smaller ones as well. And does the system heuristically decide, uh, I'm going to uh, compile this for the TPU and then run it there versus on the host CPU? Or how is that handled, if you can say? The question is, does the system, perhaps so, so meaning I'm TensorFlow, right decide dynamically whether to run on TPU or run on CPU? Right. It, it's a, it's a, at this point, it's a programmer-specified choice. So okay. TensorFlow has a with device equals kind of construct. And there are sort of equivalent special ops that map to the TPU inside of TensorFlow. Excellent. Thank you. Hi. Michael Shea. A question is uh, about your uh, multiplier unit. Is that floating point or fixed point? And how, 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 many, how many bits? It's an 8x8 eight eight fixed point multiplier. Handles both unsigned and signed integers. Oh, thank you. So, Ha uh, from Intel. Um, two quick questions. First one, um, is the 69% deployed workload on MLPs a reflection of how inefficient the TPU is on MLPs versus CNNs? If I move them all to the, to the flat part of the roof line, I don't think you'll be 69% deployed specifically. Is that the right way to read the, the deployment data? So the, the question is, is the lack of CNN adoption because we're not so good at doing CNNs? No, no. No, sorry. The fact that you said a six, you broke down the workload as 69% being deployed on MLPs. That gives the impression that there's a lot of MLP workload. But when you say deployed, it sounds like you say 69% of the machines are used for that. But if my efficiency for MLPs are lower than, you know, I cannot extract 100% of the TPU out of, uh, when I'm using it for an MLP, then I'm not actually, you know, number of T-ops, number of total ops that I would be op operating on, on MLPs and, and CNNs are not really 69% to 5%. Is that the right way to read the deployment? Data? Right. I, maybe we should take this offline because I'm not quite parsing Sure. what you're asking, but I, I think the answer is it's of machines used in the data center. So Correct. of the TPU fleet, 69% of them are running uh, MLPs. So, so the total point. number of ops for, for, for CNS is way more than 5%, 5% because you do hit the top part of your roof line as opposed to being on, this, on, this, on, on the slow part of the roof line. Okay. It, yeah, I think it's... You're multiplying how many machines we're on versus the efficiency of running any individual model. What does that turn into in terms of TOPS? I haven't done that calculation, and maybe, maybe I will ask you to switch that to offline because I should get out a piece of paper we to do, do it that. right. So, so the, the other question then is, uh, 
how does you know Google view sparsity in the weight and activation uh, space as well as you know ever lower precision? Uh, you know, people are researching ever lower precision on. on, on yeah, I I think we're Google. We're interested in all of these sorts of issues. Uh, I think relative to the TPU. Sorry. How do you view that relative to the TPU, to be specific? Um, yeah, so the first generation TPU does not actually do very much as far as sparsity goes. I think it's, it's a focus of our efforts, and I don't think we've disclosed much about what's hap happening in subsequent processors. As far as reduced precision goes, this is fundamental, right? So we, we did studies to figure out that we could get away with eight bits. We put in the backstop feature of we have a 16-bit mode, and in fact, we use that to run LSTMs. Uh, we would love to be able to train in 8-bit or 4-bit or 1-bit. We would love to know where the limit information theoretically or Kolmogorov complexity-wise is for training and inference. And we think that that is exactly the kind of thing that there's, a, there's sort of a gap between the neural network community and the architecture community attacking those problems. So if you, if you have light to shed, we'd love to know about it. Let's take one from the left. Thank you, Simon, from Facebook. Uh, you mentioned um, a small upgrade to the DRAM can improve the TPU1 speed quite a bit. Uh, we all know that TPU2 goes a different direction, and I just wonder whether Google actually pulled the trigger and have a TPU1.1 to have the upgraded memory. So the question was, given what our study said about improving the memory system versus the 1.0 version, did we build a 1.1 version? Right. Uh, and, and the answer is no, we built the cloud TPU. <laughs> so why not? Uh, because chips are expensive. <laughs> okay, so the, the direction actually goes to uh, TPU2. I, the direction is towards TPU2. Yes, that's right. right. And, and TPU2, of course, is a training machine, and so it has a much more ambitious goal and uh, a much larger scale systems approach to solving that particularly difficult problem. Thanks. Yeah. Hey, Cliff, this is a great talk. Uh, this is here. Song from Stanford. Hi, Song. Oh. Hi. Um, great talk. So I have a question with respect to mapping convolution into uh, Jam. Uh, could you comment a little bit more about the whether there's overhead of using uh, image to column follow, followed by Jam, uh, the duplication of the memory, or is there some uh, smarter way to deal with the overhead of mapping uh, the convolution through image to column to Jam onto, onto the TPU? And a uh, second question is about um, the uh, linear quantization, whether similar to the GEMM LOP library uh, from open source from uh, TensorFlow, it has a scaling factor, which is actually a floating point number at the end of each layer. Uh, so all the computation is 8-bit, but in the end, you have to multiply it with a floating point number for this to scale it. Uh, does, so does the TPU also have any floating point units or, or none at all? Okay, so, so two questions. The first one was, how do you efficiently map map or convolutions into the map model unit, given that we have this huge 256 by 256 map model unit? Uh, we actually hinted about that in the ISCA paper. We didn't talk about the specific mechanisms, but they're, they're pointed to in patents. And there are mechanisms to uh, particularly improve the row utilization of the matrix unit when we have convolutional kernels. Basically, you can unroll the kernel dimension and stack multiple depth three depth factors simultaneously into the rows of the matrix to, to get utilization back up again. So there's, I guess, at least two forms of hardware support for improving utilization there, plus the requisite software and code generation to, to improve that degree of efficiency. Your second question was, is there floating point on the device because the way that one of the TensorFlow quantized libraries works, there's a rescale factor that actually looks like a float. Uh, and right, and there is, I remember, there is also a bias uh, which is non-symmetric uh, quantization uh, in between zero, the positive and negative, there's a bias in the middle, which is a floating point number as well. Right. So within the activation pipeline, there's something that's effectively a floating point unit, although we weren't smart enough to recognize it and just drop a floating point macro in. So in instead, there's a you know, horrible last minute designed pre-shift scale by a constant of this size post-shift thing that has the moral equivalent effect of multiplying by a floating point number. And, and basically, the translation is from the 32-bit accumulator, you have some value, which you know, is plus or minus 2 billion, where 0 is probably 0, and some number, 400,000 or something like that, corresponds to 6 on the real number line. You need to multiply by that real number factor to translate back into our quantized arithmetic 8-bit representation. 
Oh, I see. So there's no floating point unit at all, but you're compensated through the software part. Well, if you squint, maybe it's a cheap floating point unit. Or floating like, point unit, OK. <laughs> right. Like I said, like, if I had to do it again, I would buy a real floating point unit and, and like, you know, not have wrestled with those particular headaches, which you know, still create bugs today. OK. And do you find this? Sorry for cutting you off. I got to manage okay. time Thanks. here. We yeah. ran out of time, but let's thank our speaker, Cliff, again. Uh, that concludes our session, and I'm going to now hand it over to D-Leap for the architecture session. Thank you.